So the title of this talk is A Conservative Revolutionary, John Jay's Struggle for Liberty and Law. Now, in the previous three lectures of this series, we've experienced, we've explored many of the key themes that together make up a national conservative approach to understanding human affairs and exercising wise statesmanship. This approach is conservative in as much as it champions continuity with the past, ordered liberty that combines individual freedom with respect for law, incremental reform that takes seriously the foibles of human nature, the limits of politics, and the inevitability of unintended consequences. And finally, a moderate constitutionalism that rests government on a consent exercised by established institutions and embodied in traditional rights. This approach is nationalist in as much as it takes seriously the particularity of human experience and custom that must chasten the abstract ideals of lawmakers. The bonds of loyalty that sustain the identity of a people, the dangers of imperial overreach as hostile to liberty at home and abroad, and the necessity for each nation to proudly assert its own national interest and national honor on the world stage while acknowledging the equal rights of other nations. So these, I think, sum up the themes that we've been looking at in this series that will come together tonight. Now, also more particularly in the first lecture, we looked at the importance of the judiciary as a bulwark of conservatism, but a bulwark that should not see itself as tasked with a reactionary protection of the status quo, but instead with a judicious adaptation of the law to changing circumstances. In the second lecture, we saw how Richard Hooker's Protestantism informed his opposition to the universalizing ambitions of the Roman Catholic Church at that time and his pride in English national sovereignty. And how this, and, and this stance be, later became central to Britain's self-conception as the guardian of Protestantism and liberty against the despotic claims of French and Spanish popery. In the third lecture, we saw how the continental thinkers Montesquieu and Vattel drew lessons from Britain's subsequent rise to global power about the importance of a, the balance of power abroad and the balanced constitution at home and how Britain's global hegemony after 1763 threatened to upset both of these balances. Now the greatest imbalance of the, the, the greatest result of this imbalance, of course, was the war for American independence, which began as a protest against Britain's attempt to remodel her colonial possessions along more explicitly imperial lines, subject to the close control of the mother country. In response, Americans bred under the common law to a love of law and liberty and a keen sense of their rights as Englishmen protested ever more vigorously against what they saw as an unprovoked invasion of their traditional rights as largely self-governing polities under the crown. When Britain proved itself ready to enforce its claims at the end of a bayonet, American statesmen declared we, for our parts, are determined to live free or not at all. And we are resolved that posterity shall never reproach us with having brought slaves into the world. The author of these stirring lines penned on behalf of the Second Continental Congress in 1775 was John Jay, a man who was to combine in his remarkable life and work nearly all of the key themes that have occupied our attention in this series of lectures. Now, section two, a life in the spotlight. John Jay was born in 1745 in New York City, then a bustling merchant town of 11,000. Like many Americans of his era, he would remain closely tethered to this hometown for most of his long life, even as duty would call him first to the center of continental affairs in Philadelphia, and then to the great power centers of Europe, Madrid, Paris, London. Wherever Jay traveled and whatever task he shouldered, his heart remained in New York City, the city and the state, the, the, in New York, at least, the city and the state to which he would dedicate extraordinary labors. He attended college at King's, later Columbia and Manhattan, 
and was one of the most prosperous lawyers in the colony by 1774. Before being catapulted to the forefront of affairs as a New York delegate at the first and second Continental Congresses. He returned to New York in 1776 as one of the key members of its committee to establish a new state constitution before serving as the state's first chief justice. In that epical year in which bold dreams of independence clashed with the disheartening realities of invasion and military defeat, he rallied the flagging spirits of his countrymen with an address of the Convention of the State of New York, one of the most stirring and powerful statements of patriotic determination that the war produced. In 1787 to 88, he stood shoulder to shoulder with Alexander Hamilton in the Herculean task of securing ratification of the new US Constitution in New York, the state with the largest and most well-organized anti-federalist opposition. He would later run for governor of the state, first unsuccessfully in 1792, but then successfully for two three-year terms in 1795 and 1798. His long years of retirement were spent in Bedford, a long day's ride northeast of New York City. And at his death in 1829, the New York Bar Association declared 30 days of mourning in honor of one, quote, whose great patriotism, his great talents as a statesman, and his great acquirements as a jurist, his eminent piety as a Christian and probity as a man, all unite to present him to the public as an example whose radiance points to the attainment of excellence. However, despite the intimate bonds that attached him to his hometown and his home state, Jay's horizons were vastly wider than most of his contemporaries. From relatively early in the Revolutionary War, Jay displayed a broad continental perspective, perceiving keenly the future greatness of the American nation. Quote, extensive wildernesses now scarcely known or exposed remain yet to be cultivated and vast lakes and rivers whose waters have for ages rolled in silence and obscurity to the ocean are yet to hear the din of industry, become subservient to commerce, and boast villas, gilded spires, and spacious cities rising on their backs. More than perhaps any founder besides his friend Hamilton, Jay worked tirelessly to promote a sense of national identity among his often stubbornly provincial and narrow-minded compatriots. His Federalist number two is justly famed as one of the classic statements of early American nationalism. But it merely gives voice to convictions that are peppered throughout Jay's letters over the previous years. In 1783, for instance, he had written to Gouverneur Morris, quote, no time is to be lost in raising and maintaining a national spirit in America. And he recognized from the beginning that such a national spirit would require an effective national government. When this government was formed, few men were as so well equipped as Jay to help lead it. From 1774 onward, he had played a leading role in the struggle for a new nation. In the First Continental Congress, he had penned the eloquent address to the people of Great Britain, which was dispatched by Congress in 1774, containing the most, the, the most powerful statement of the colony's grievances and their understanding of America's role in the conflict, which was, the guardian of historic British liberties that the increasingly arbitrary government in Whitehall was seeking to uproot throughout the empire. In 1775, this acknowledged master of English prose was called on again to write Congress's appeal to the oppressed inhabitants of Canada, exhorting them to share in the struggle for liberty. After his work in New York, Jay was summoned back to Congress in 1778 and was soon elected as president of the Continental Congress. A year later, he was dispatched on his first diplomatic mission as minister plenipotentiary to Spain. In 1782, he was transferred to Paris to help lead American peace negotiations with Britain. The resulting Treaty of Paris, which Joseph Ellis calls the greatest triumph in the annals of American diplomacy, was masterminded by Jay, who, although the youngest member of America's three-man negotiating team, displayed the foresight, courage, and keen sense of national honor that earned him the principal merit for the achievement in the eyes of his colleague, John Adams, who, if you know anything about Adams, was never one quick to concede merit to any of his rivals. Now, on returning to America in 1784, 
Jay was almost immediately conscripted into the most important role in the Confederation Congress, the Secretary for Foreign Affairs. And on the dissolution of that Congress in 1788 was named by George Washington to the third highest post in the new national government, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Crucial as this role was for securing the foundations of constitutional government, Washington called Jay away from it in 1794 for another critical diplomatic assignment. This time as envoy extraordinary to Great Britain to prevent America being drawn into the international conflagration of war unleashed by the French Revolution. The resulting Jay Treaty of 1795, although it was fiercely maligned by political opponents who desired a close alliance with France and who still despised their former mother country, was a scarcely less significant diplomatic achievement than the Treaty of Paris had been. It gained America the breathing space to stand on her own as a young nation among the powers of the world. Now, given Jay's lifelong record of public service as one of the chief architects of the American nation, it is perhaps the more remarkable that Jay was an extremely reluctant revolutionary. He was one of those who fought hardest for peaceful conciliation at the outbreak of the Revolutionary War and who held out longest against the Declaration of Independence. Yet when he was convinced that war was inevitable, he threw himself into the cause with complete self-dedication. His remarks in a letter 20 years later when, while negotiating the Jay Treaty sum up well his posture throughout his public life. We live in an eventful season. We have nothing to do but our duty. And one part of it is to prepare for every event. Let us preserve peace while it can be done with propriety. And if in that we fail, let us wage war, not in newspapers and impotent sarcasms, but with manly firmness and with unanimous and vigorous efforts. Having once committed himself, Jay never wavered in his faith that from this struggle would arise a great nation that would extend and enrich the legacy of England's Protestant liberty across the vast expanse of a new continent. There were few patriots who felt as keenly as did Jay a sense of continuity between America's British colonial past and her independent national future. Although he himself was of French Huguenot stock, Jay had always treasured the British heritage in America and the legacy of laws and political institutions that it had bequeathed to the young Republic. As he wrote to a newspaper man in 1796, quote, it certainly is chiefly owing to the institutions, laws and principles of policy and government originally derived to us as British colonists, that with the favor of heaven, the people of this country are what they are. And yet, despite the frequent accusations of Anglophilia that were lobbed at him by his opponents, few patriots felt as keenly as Jay the importance of America being able to hold her head high as a nation not independent in name only, but truly ready to chart her own course and earn the grudging respect of old world potentates. Now, with this introduction to Jay in mind, let me give you a brief roadmap for the rest of the lecture here. We're going to have three main sections. First, we will look at Jay's conservative understanding of the American Revolution and his determination to maintain as much continuity as possible in the midst of the break with Great Britain. Second, we will look at his conservative role in the formation of the new republic, in which he sought to instill in his fellow citizens a dual commitment to law and liberty, resisting the libertinism of radical democracy that the revolution had unleashed in parts of America and that caught fire in France in 1789. And then in the final section, we'll see how Jay's nationalist and realist foreign policy sought to make good on America's claim to independence, recognizing the shared interests and culture that continued to unite America and Britain while insisting that America should never forfeit her freedom of action or sacrifice her distinctive interests. So with that roadmap in hand, let's turn to section three, a reluctant revolutionary. When John Jay came to Philadelphia in the summer of 1774 for the First Continental Congress, he was eager neither for war nor for American independence. To be sure, the situation was critical the Boston Tea Party of 1773 had been followed by the Intolerable Acts, 
whereby Parliament closed the port of Boston and imposed martial law, depriving Massachusetts citizens of many of their ordinary rights as Englishmen. Hard on the heels of this measure, the 1774 Quebec Act alarmed colonists still further, especially arch Protestants like Jay, who saw a sinister connection between its quasi-establishment of Roman Catholicism in Canada and its mimicry of popish forms of arbitrary power that the French had formerly used in their colonial administration. Agitation was spreading throughout the colonies and representatives were assembling in Philadelphia to make common cause against this expanding tyranny by orchestrating a boycott and making spirited protests in Britain. To be sure, some of the delegates already had more radical ideas. The fire-breathing Patrick Henry of Virginia declared his view that, quote, government is at an end and all America is thrown into one mass. Jay demurred, however, quote, the measure of arbitrary power is not full and I think it must run over before we undertake to frame a new constitution. While continuing to debate concrete measures, Congress agreed in the importance of a forceful petition to Great Britain. Despite his youth, he was then only 28, Jay was selected as chief author of this Address to the People of Great Britain, a document that powerfully summarized the American cause of this date, but that also gives us a valuable window into Jay's conservative thinking. In this address, Jay repeatedly expresses the American people's sense of shared identity in the British Empire and in all that it had historically stood for. Quote, in almost every age, in repeated conflicts, in long and bloody wars, as well civil as foreign, against many and powerful nations, against the open assaults of enemies, the more dangerous treachery of friends, have the inhabitants of your island, your great and glorious ancestors, maintained their independence and transmitted the rights of men and the blessings of liberty to you, their posterity. The Americans, wrote Jay, were, quote, descended from the same com common ancestors. Their, quote, forefathers participated in all the rights, the liberties, and the constitution that you so justly boast of and have carefully conveyed the same fair inheritance to us. Thus, he argued that it was not simply their right, it was their obligation to stand up on behalf of this inheritance of liberty, not only on their own behalf in the colonies, but in order to protect liberty in Britain, lest the corrupt ministry, quote, by having our lives and property in their power may with the greater facility enslave you. The American grievances from Jay's perspective revolved around two chief issues. The first was the abridgment of traditional English liberties and legal procedures. Of course, this had begun with Parliament's usurpation of the power of taxation, but it escalated dramatically with the recent coercive acts, which had infringed one of the most sacred English traditions, trial by jury of one's peers. Quote, by the course of our law, wrote Jay, offenses committed in such of the British dominions in which courts are established and justice duly and regularly administered shall there be tried by a jury of the vicinage. Now, however, quote, offenders are to be taken by force together with all such persons as may be pointed out as witnesses and carried to England, there to be tried in a distant land by a jury of strangers. The occasion for these draconian measures, of course, had been the Boston Tea Party. Jay, parting ways from some of the more radical patriots, had deplored such lawlessness. And in the address, he tacitly conceded the perpetrators were probably liable to legal action. However, rather than following due process of law, the English ministry had enacted summary punishment on the entire city of Boston, quote, involving the innocent in one common punishment with the guilty, and for the act of 30 or 40 to bring poverty, distress, and calamity on 30,000 souls, and those not your enemies, but your friends, brethren, and fellow subjects. If this weren't alarming enough, there was the Quebec Act to consider. As the descendant of fleeing Huguenots, Jay still perceived the world very much through the lens of British Protestant liberty against French Catholic tyranny. And he saw the qualified establishment of Catholicism and French civil law in Canada as proof that Whitehall had fallen prey to Popish impulses. The colonists neighbors to the North, he fulminated, quote, are now the subjects of arbitrary government 
deprived of trial by jury, and when imprisoned cannot claim the benefit of, of the habeas corpus act, that great bulwark and palladium of English liberty. Nor can we suppress our astonishment that a British parliament should ever consent to establish in that country a religion that has deluged your island in blood and dispersed impiety, bigotry, persecution, murder, and rebellion through every part of the world. With many of his fellow colonists, Jay saw the Quebec Act as the tip of a spear that was set to, quote, reduce the ancient free Protestant colonies to the same state of slavery as the French Canadians. The obvious solution in the face of all this was not independence, but greater union. The ministry's strategy, Jay argued, was to divide and conquer. But the free peoples of Great Britain and America must band together in defense of their ancient rights. Take care, the address warned complacent Englishmen, that you do not fall into the pit that is preparing for us. Jay concluded the document with a ringing denial that America harbored separatist ambitions. You have been told that we are seditious, impatient of government, and desirous of independence. Be assured that these are not facts, but calumnies. Permit us to be as free as yourselves, and we shall ever esteem a union with you to be our greatest glory and our greatest happiness. We shall ever be ready to contribute all in our power to the welfare of the empire. We shall consider your enemies as our enemies and your interests as our own. Jay was wholly sincere in this protestation against a desire for independence. In the Second Continental Congress the following year, Jay participated in the drafting of another petition that sought earnestly to avoid a permanent break even after the outbreak of war and conceded the traditional, quote, right of the British Parliament to regulate the commercial concerns of the empire. Comparing this draft with the final version penned by Jonathan Dickinson, the so-called Olive Branch petition, Jay's biographer notes that he, quote, was more conciliatory than even the member of Congress known as the leader of the conciliators. As late as April 1776, Jay remained staunchly opposed to any talk of independence and called the claim that Congress was considering it, quote, an ungenerous and groundless charge. Nearly five decades later, having done more than perhaps anyone besides Washington and Adams to make American independence a reality, Jay was still adamant that America had not sought independence but had it forced upon them. Replying to a letter from George Otis of Quincy, Massachusetts about a recently published history of the Revolutionary War by the Italian historian Carlo Botta, Jay took umbrage at Botta's claim that Congress's quote, real object all along was independence. On the contrary, he said, explicit professions and assurances of allegiance and loyalty to the sovereign and of affection for the mother country abound in the journals of the colonial legislatures and of the Congresses and conventions from early periods to the second petition of Congress in 1775. If these professions and assurances were sincere, they afford evidence more than sufficient to invalidate the charge of our desiring and aiming at independence. Otis replied to this letter by saying that he had shared Jay's remarks with John Adams, who had warmly concurred, adding, for my own part, there was not a moment during the revolution when I would not have given everything I possessed for a restoration to the state of things before the contest began, provided we could have had a sufficient security for its continuance. Indeed, strictly speaking, Jay had elsewhere argued, America did not fight to gain independence so much as to maintain it. In a revealing letter to the Reverend Samuel Miller in 1800, Jay had objected to Miller's funeral sermon for George Washington for speaking of America's quote, glorious emancipation from Britain. Jay said, quote, the Congress of 1774 and 1775 regarded the people of this country as being free. And such was their opinion of the liberty we enjoyed so late as the year 1763, that they declared that the colonies would be satisfied on being replaced in the political situation in which they then were. It was not until after the year 1763 that Britain attempted to subject us to arbitrary domination. Thus, we became a distinct nation 
And I think truth will justify our indulging the pride of saying that we and our ancestors have kept our necks free from yokes and that the term emancipation is not applicable to us. From Jay's perspective, the purpose of the struggle had been to return America and Britain to the status quo of 1763. And only Britain's needless aggression had forced America to, fir to formally separate and take control of her own destiny. Section four, building a new nation. All right. So on John Jay's reading, American independence was not originally sought as a good in itself, as it was for radicals like Thomas Paine, but rather it was a means to uphold the traditional laws that served as the bulwarks of American liberty. After the Declaration of 1776, De Declaration of Independence in 1776, Jay threw himself enthusiastically into the fight to defend the independence thus declared. But he remained convinced that the preservation of American liberty depended on the rule of law, not abstract ideals or high-minded peons to the innate goodness of the people. The people, he often observed, were equally capable of, quote, great virtues and of many great and little vices, which will predominate, he wrote to Washington in 1779, is a question which events not yet produced nor now to be discerned can alone determine. It would depend not on mere good intentions, but on effective government. Quote, the dissolution of our government threw us into a political chaos. Time, wisdom, and perseverance will reduce it into form and give us strength, order, and harmony. Seven years later, as the Confederation Congress languished in increasing impotence, Jay was somewhat less optimistic, confessing himself to Washington, quote, uneasy and apprehensive, more so than during the war. The mass of men, he lamented, are neither wise nor good. And the virtue, like the other resources of a country, can only be drawn to a point and exerted by strong circumstances ably managed or a strong government ably administered. New governments have not the aid of habit and hereditary respect and being generally the result of preceding tumult and confusion do not immediately acquire stability or strength. Too many rabble rousers in revolutionary America operating on the thoroughly uncommonsensical dictum of Thomas Paine that that government is best which governs least had tried to sell the American people on the idea that theirs was a revolution, not simply against arbitrary government or government from abroad, but against government as such. In one letter to a friend as the crisis of Shays rebellion was coming to a head in late 1786, Jay declared, it is time for our people to distinguish more accurately than they seem to do between liberty and licentiousness. The late revolution would lose much of its glory as well as utility if our conduct should confirm that Tory maxim that men are incapable of governing themselves. Indeed, Jay knew history and human nature well enough to recognize that too much assertion of liberty could easily produce its opposite. As he observed to Jefferson around the same time, quote, the charms of liberty will daily fade for well-intentioned Americans, seeing the dis disorder of the new republic, quote, and in seeking for peace and security, they will too naturally turn towards systems in direct opposition to those which oppress and disquiet them. If faction should long bear down law and government, tyranny may raise its head or the more sober part of the people may even think of a king. Jay would later voice similar sentiments in his famous 1788 address to the people of the state of New York, generally hailed as the most important contribution to the great debate over New York's ratification of the constitution. Of course, such a turn from liberty to security was precisely the sequence that soon unfolded in France, a revolution that Jay, unlike Jefferson, was wary of from the beginning. In his first letter on the subject in December 18, 1789, Jay granted that the French Revolution certainly promises much, and he hoped it would deliver on that promise. But he worried that, quote, there are many nations not yet ripe for liberty, and I fear that even France has some lessons to learn 
and perhaps to pay for on the subject of free government. To a French correspondent a few months later, Jay offered the Burkean admonition, two years before Burke was to write his famous reflections. The natural propensity in mankind of passing from one extreme too far toward the opposite one sometimes leads me to apprehend that that may be the case with your National Assembly. By 1796, as Jeffersonian still defended France and celebrated her achievements for liberty, Jay observed that the latter stage of the French Revolution, quote, had in my eye more the appearance of a woe than a blessing. It has caused torrents of blood and of tears and has been marked in its progress by atrocities very injurious to the cause of liberty and offensive to morality and humanity. Finally, in 1810, Jay would lament to a correspondent, there came forth with the French Revolution a spirit of delusion, which like an influenza passed over and infected all Europe. Even our distant country has not entirely escaped. The fact that the American Revolution did not follow the same destructive course was due in no small part to Jay's tireless efforts to instill a respect for the rule of law in his restless compatriots. As an eminent lawyer in pre-revolutionary America, Jay found himself elevated first to Chief Justice of New York and later to the position of Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court. In these roles, Jay was not merely called upon to hear cases, but he also played an important educative role, instructing the American people in the art of self-government through the regular charges to grand juries that he was called upon to give when overseeing circuit courts. On his first circuit as Supreme Court Justice in spring, spring of 1790, Jay offered a powerful summary of his political philosophy in his charge to the jurors. It cannot be too strongly impressed in the minds of all of us how greatly our individual prosperity depends on our national prosperity and how greatly our national prosperity depends on a well-organized, vigorous government ruling by wise and equal laws faithfully executed. Nor is such a government unfriendly to liberty, to that liberty which is really estimable, inest inestimable. On the contrary, nothing but a strong government of laws irresistibly bearing down arbitrary power and licentiousness can defend liberty against those two formidable en enemies. Let it be remembered that civil liberty consists not in a right to every man to do just what he pleases but it consists in an equal right to all the citizens to have, enjoy, and to do in peace, security, and without molestation, whatever the equal and constitutional laws of the country should admit to be consistent with the public good. All the key elements of Jay's Federalist perspective are here. The close connection between individual and national prosperity, the need for a vigorous government to act as a safeguard of liberty, and the wide difference between libertarianism and the ordered liberty that rests on laws enacted by the people. However, we should emphasize that Jay knew better than to simply equate the rule of law with the will of the people in the way that Robespierre or Jefferson would. In the early years of the revolution, many Americans imagined that all that was needed for free government was a representative legislature by which the people would rule themselves by laws of their own making. Many of the early state constitutions, accordingly, vested nearly all political authority in the state legislatures, with governors and judges stripped of much of their power. For Jay, however, the value and authority of law lay in its ability not merely to express the present will of the people, but to reconcile this with the people's past identity and with their future interests. An, an untrammeled legislature would be liable to reverse laws almost as soon as they were enacted and to pass laws that undermine traditional liberties or disastrously compromise long-term interests. To anchor present lawmaking in the soil of the past and to prevent short-sighted decisions, a strong executive and an independent judiciary were necessary. Accordingly, Jay fought to make the New York constitution the most conservative of all the original US state constitutions with a strong governor and a council of revision that could veto rash legislation. As the first Chief Justice of New York, Jay served on this council, and he repeatedly sought to restrain tyrannical actions of the state legislature against suspected Tories. 
that egregiously violated hallowed principles of the English common law. Later, as Congress's Secretary for Foreign Affairs in the years following the war, Jay would fight a similarly thankless battle against the petty and vindictive state legislatures who systematically undermined the hard earned Treaty of Paris and all received principles of international law by their continued persecution of Tories and their refusal to pay debts due to British creditors. All of these experiences led Jay in the lead up to the Constitutional Convention to champion a new federal government that tied the national legislature to a strong and independent executive branch and a national judiciary that was able to articulate the supreme law of the land. In Federalist Number 5, Jay would voice the key principle of the co-equality of the three branches as guardians of the rule of law. The judgments of our courts and the commissions constitutionally given by our governor are as valid and as binding on all persons whom they concern as the laws passed by our legislature. All constitutional acts of power, whether in the executive or in the judicial department, have as much legal validity and obligation as if they proceeded from the legislature. So section five, America among the nations. <clears throat> now given Jay's professed regard for the English constitution and common law and his early reticence to accept a break with the mother country, it's little surprise that he was dogged throughout his career with charges of excessive Anglophilia, particularly in the aftermath of the controversial Jay Treaty of 1795 which secured American neutrality in the war then raging between Britain and France. Jay was loudly denounced by his slavish, for his slavish dependence on Great Britain. In fact, however, few leaders of the founding era worked so tirelessly to give real substance to America's claim to independence or so clearly and, artic and consistently articulated a foreign policy of American nationalism and self-determination as did John Jay. The problem of course, was that for the first few decades of Americans' nationhood, many of Jay's compatriots had allowed their hostility toward Britain to cloud their judgment, driving them into an alliance with France that threatened to become a new bondage little better than the one they had left. From the beginning of the French alliance in 1777, Jay worried about the mismatch between America with her Protestant religion, common law, and representative institutions, and France, Catholic, civil law and absolutist. He confided to his friend Governor Morris in 1778, what the French treaty may be, I know not. If Britain would acknowledge our independence and enter into a liberal alliance with us, I should prefer a connection with her to a league with any power on earth. Before long, however, he came to accept that since America desperately needed French aid and had also pledged her national honor to that alliance, she should remain faithful to it but only so far as honor strictly dictated. And soon he came to deplore the idea of entangling alliances altogether. Having been sent to Madrid to negotiate an alliance with Spain, which had recently entered the war against Britain for its own purposes, Jay quickly grasped that Spain had little interest in advancing the cause of American independence, but meant simply to use the Americans as a tool against Britain while keeping her as weak as possible. Particularly vexing was Spain's determination, although she already controlled three quarters of the territory in North and South America, to stake a claim to most of the lands between the Appalachians and the Mississippi, lands the new American states were already counting on settling. After being forced to fritter away two years in pointless negotiations, all the while left by Congress's improvidence and humiliating dependence on stingy, stingy, stingy Spanish financial aid, Jay left Madrid in 1782, thoroughly disillusioned about the realities of European power politics. Having learned this lesson, he arrived in Paris for peace talks with a sharp nose for detecting duplicity. And he soon scented that behind their generous facade, the French ministers were every bit as cynical in their dealings with the idealistic young Republic. They supported Spain's territorial aspirations east of the Mississippi and admonished Jay that America's claims in that direction were delusional. Even worse was in store. When the British Peace Commission offered to negotiate with, quote, the American colonies, tacitly denying American independence, 
Jay fiercely protested. The French foreign minister, Comte de Vergen, however, sided with the, French, with the British commissioners and condescendingly admonished Jay that it was foolish to expect recognition of independence until the treaty was signed. Jay quickly determined that the only way for America to secure her real independence over the long run was to forthrightly assert it at the outset in the peace negotiations. However, the situation was extremely awkward because Congress, which is skillfully manipulated and liberally bribed by the French ambassador, had sent its peace commissioners humiliating instructions to, quote, undertake nothing without France's knowledge and concurrence, and ultimately to govern yourselves by their knowledge and concurrence. Jay's fellow commissioner, Benjamin Franklin, the senior diplomat, American diplomat in Europe, advised Jay not to rock the boat with the French and felt that he was being unnecessarily paranoid. However, in a climactic carriage ride back from Versailles, Jay forcefully argued his case and convinced Franklin to defy their instructions from Congress and shut the French out of the negotiations. Summarizing his reasoning in a dispatch to Robert R. Livingston, Secretary for Foreign Affairs, he wrote, so far, and in such matters as this court may think it in their interest to support us, they certainly will, but no further, in my opinion. They are interested in separating us from Great Britain, and on that point, we may, I believe, depend on them. But it is not their interest that we should become a great and formidable people, and therefore they will not help us to become so. It is not their interest that such a treaty should be formed between us and Britain as would produce cordiality and mutual confidence. They will therefore endeavor to plant such seeds of jealousy, discontent, and discord in it as may naturally and perpetually keep us keep our eyes fixed on France for security. This consideration must induce them to, ren to wish to render Britain formidable in our neighborhood and to leave us as few resources of wealth and power as possible. I think we have no rational dependence except on God and ourselves. If we lean on France's love of liberty, her affection for America, or her disinterested magnanimity, we shall lean on a broken reed that will sooner or later pierce our hands. Although Livingston was furious when he received this dispatch, so slow were North, North Atlantic communications in those days that by the time his rebuke reached Jay, the treaty had been signed for months, a treaty that historians consider the greatest triumph in the annals of American diplomacy. It gained terms from Britain that France considered almost unbelievably advantageous. For decades thereafter, even Jay's detractors had to grudgingly concede that the Treaty of Paris was indeed remarkably good for American interests. But they argued that he had simply lucked out while taking a foolish gamble that unnecessarily alienated America's well-intentioned French allies. Modern archival research, however, has demonstrated that Jay was almost exactly and uncannily correct in his surmises of French intentions. Vergen did hope to delay Britain's recognition of American independence as long as possible to keep America in the war until France and Spain achieved their own expansionist war aims. He did hope to limit American territorial fishing and trade privileges to keep her weak, and he did hope to prevent any real rapprochement between her and Britain, between, between the US and Britain so that the US would remain dependent on France for decades to come. Now we should note that Jay's suspicion of France did not entail naivete toward Britain. Quote, if they again thought they could conquer us, he had written to Livingston, they would again attempt it. The key, Jay realized, was to rely on no one's benevolence. America must, quote, be as independent on the charity of our friends as on the mercy of our enemies. Instead, sound foreign policy involved seeking to establish as much as possible a long-term alignment of interests while maintaining a strong military that would deter greedy European powers. As he wrote to John Adams in the midst of the Paris negotiations, war must make peace for us, and we shall always find well-appointed armies to be our ablest negotiators. However, Jay did believe that once Britain abandoned any claims to, to lordship over America, the estranged mother and daughter would find in their common culture a basis for lasting friendship. It was in this conviction, which Washington and Hamilton shared, that Jay sailed to London in 1794 to prevent America being drawn into the new European war on the side of revolutionary France. 
Despite attempts by Francophiles in America to scuttle the detente, Jay succeeded once again in negotiating a durable and advantageous peace settlement, in part because he found his earlier hopes for resurgent Anglophone fellow feeling richly repaid. Quote, the idea which everywhere prevails, he wrote to Washington from London, is that the quarrel between Britain and America was a family quarrel and that it is time it should be made up. For my part, I am for making it up and for cherishing this disposition on their part by justice, benevolence, and good manners on ours. But this did not mean that America should slavishly attach herself to Britain any more than to France. Quote, to cast ourselves into the arms of this or any other nation would be degrading, injurious, and puerile. Nor, in my opinion, ought we to have any political connection with a foreign power. Here, as elsewhere in his, in his political career, Jay was a shrewd pragmatist, but he also acted on the basis of deep-seated principles. In this case, the principle was his Vitellian commitment to the equality and independence of all nations. His claims on behalf of American independence were not cynical ploys to enable America to export her revolutionary ideas to the rest of the world, but reflected a foreign policy application of the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. As he said in the 1793 speech, quote, in like manner, the nations throughout the world are like so many great families placed by providence on the earth, who having divided it between them remain perfectly distinct from and independent of each other. Between them, there is no judge but the great judge of all. They have a perfect right to establish such governments and build such houses as they prefer. And their neighbors have no right to pull down either because not fashioned according to their ideas of perfection. In a word, one has no right to interfere in the affairs of another, but all are bound to behave to each other with respect, with justice, with benevolence, and with good faith. Throughout the 1790s, Jay firmly maintained this principle of non-interference in the face of strong democratic Republican pressure for America to join her former French ally in her glorious fight for Republican freedom throughout Europe. And against equally strong pressure, among some of, his, some of his high Federalist allies for America to support Britain openly against these bloodthirsty revolutionaries. Drafting a proclamation of neutrality in 1792 at Washington and Hamilton's request, he wrote, quote, although certain circumstances have attended that revolution, which are greatly to be regretted, yet the United States as a nation have no right to decide on measures which regard only the internal and domestic affairs of others. They who actually administer the government of any nation are by foreign nations to be regarded as its lawful rulers, as long as they continue to be recognized and obeyed by the great body of the people. Thus, inasmuch as the various French revolutionary administrations broadly commanded the consent of the French nation, Jay insisted that America must recognize them and deal respectfully with them. However, inasmuch as they sought to export their ideals to the rest of Europe by force of arms, America could have nothing to do with such imperialism. Writing in 1796 to a British friend who was naively enthusiastic about French revolutionary ideals, Jay observed philosophically, I should not think that man wise who should employ his time in endeavoring to contrive a shoe that would fit every foot. And they do not appear to me much more wise who expect to devise a government that would suit every nation. I have no objections to, men, to men's mending or changing their own shoes, but I object to their insisting on my mending or changing mine. I am content that little men should be as free as big ones and have and enjoy the same rights. But nothing strikes me as more absurd than projects to stretch little men into big ones or shrink big men into little ones. Liberty and reformation may run mad and madness of any kind is no blessing. In short, he concluded, well, we must take men and things as they are and act accordingly, that is, circumspectly. Conclusion. While Jay's national conservative principles, articulated over a lifetime of public service and private correspondence, are eloquent and instructive, they are hardly unique. History has seen many men of high-minded conservative principles who proved to be woefully inadequate statesmen, prone to erratic outbursts, short-sighted decisions, and tactless actions that alienated important associates. Jay's friends and close political allies, 
John Adams and Alexander Hamilton in some measure fit this description. Although they were great and indispensable leaders of the early Republic, both of them struggled to control their fierce pride and fiery tempers and suffered disastrous lapses of judgment, precipitating a fateful split within the Federalist Party and threatening the foundations of the young nation. What made Jay such an exemplary and successful statesman, albeit one unlikely to ever have a hit musical named after him, was his ability to practice what he preached. Jay embodied this conservatism in his personal life. When Jay wrote about the necessity for America to learn the restraint and moderation of self-government, he spoke from personal experience. Stymied at a critical point in his career by brazen election fraud that deprived him of the New York governorship and urged by his friends to fight back with every means at his disposal, Jay demurred calmly reassuring his agitated wife, having nothing to reproach myself with in relation to this event. It shall neither discompose my temper nor postpone my sleep. A few years more will put us all in the dust and it will then be of more importance to me to have governed myself than to have governed the state. Although he was a stickler for America's national honor, the Treaty of Paris and throughout his diplomatic career, Jay recognized, as Adams and Hamilton never quite could, that protecting the nation's honor might require its representatives to submit to dishonor with equanimity. Greeted in America after the Jay Treaty of 1795 with a storm of scurrilous criticism, Jay remained unflappable. Quote, be that as it may, I shall continue to possess my mind in peace and be prepared to meet with composure and fortitude whatever evils may result to me from the faithful discharge of my duty to my country. The history of Greece and other less ancient governments is not unknown to either of us, nor are we ignorant of what patriots have suffered from domestic factions and foreign intrigues in almost every age. Faced with the maddeningly slow progress of justice and good government, even on so morally urgent an issue as the abolition of slavery, Jay exhibited a profound patience convinced that the justice of God would overcome the machinations of evil men in due time. Quote, the wise and the good never form the majority in any large society. And it seldom happens that their measures are uniformly adopted or that they can always prevent being overborne themselves by the strong and almost never ceasing union of the wicked and the weak. These circumstances tell us to be patient and to moderate those sanguine expectations which warm and good hearts often mislead even wise heads to entertain on those subjects. All that the best men can do is to persevere in doing their duty to their country and leave the consequences to him who made it their duty, being neither elated by success, however great, nor discouraged by disappointments, however frequent and mortifying. Jay's theology was the secret to success. Many political leaders tend to veer between extremes of idealism and cynicism, placing their faith in utopian schemes for human improvement or else despairing of achieving anything except by the most self-interested real politic. Jay avoided both ditches throughout his career. As a devout Anglican, Jay took human frailty and corruption very seriously. In the very first letter we have preserved from his pen at age 21, he observed, the ways of men you know are as circular as the orbit through which our planet moves and the center to which they gravitate is self. Round this we move in mystic measures, dancing to every tune that is loudest played by heaven or hell. Throughout his long decades of public service, Jay never lost this healthy realism, which gave him an uncanny ability to judge motives and predict behaviors, whether dealing with devious European diplomats or recalcitrant state legislators. At the same time, while he had little faith in people, he had a great deal of faith in his God. Over and over in his letters and public statements, Jay expressed his profound and serene faith that God was in control and that he would ensure the final success of the American cause. At one of the darkest hours of the war, when the continental currency was collapsing and the continental army languished unpaid and ill-equipped, he could write to his countrymen, and can there be any reason to apprehend that the divine disposer of human events, after having separated us from the house of bondage and led us safe through a sea of blood towards the land of liberty and promise, will leave the work of our political redemption unfinished and either permit us to perish in a wilderness of difficulties 
or suffer us to be carried back in chains to that country of oppression? From whose tyranny he hath mercifully delivered us with a stretched out arm. Thus it was that amidst the tumult and wreckage of the election of 1800, when his fellow Federalists were convinced that, quote, an atheist in religion and a fanatic in politics had seized the helm of the state and was about to drive the young nation aground, that Jay was able to stand as a rock of calm in the storm. Although he had the power as governor of all important New York to defy the popular vote and appoint a slate of Federalist electors that would deny Jefferson the presidency, he knew well that just because something was technically legal did not mean it was honorable and that that which was dishonorable could never be truly expedient. Jay used his weighty influence to reconcile his fellow Federalists to this unhappy election result, ensuring that the first real transfer of power in American history would be a peaceful one. In so doing, he safeguarded the still fragile bonds of national, national unity which he had fought so hard to forge in his many roles over the previous quarter century. As national conservatives today grapple with an unhappy election result and rampant atheism and fanaticism in the halls of power, perhaps we may learn anew from John Jay's serene confidence and tireless labors and thereby give our fractured nation a new lease on life. <laughs>